So everybody's got a, a reasonable set of bevelers, like more than just one, like several sizes of whatever kind you got. Okay, good. Because there's some smaller stuff here, well, you know, where you'll need some smaller ones, but having a good size one will help you get through that a little bit quicker. Um, if I were going to use the undercut bevelers, like y'all have. Um, this is the point I would do that. I do that after the pear shading, but before I start the regular beveling, uh, I would do that. Um, I don't do that because, well, first of all, I don't. I didn't do it at all on this pattern, and I'm not going to because I'm trying to be faithful to what Frank Minia did. You know, I'm trying to keep it in his realm. Uh, so I didn't. You could. This one here lends itself incredibly well to a lot of that lifting, and if you wish to do that, that's fine. You can. Um, but I, even if I were going to do that, I'd do it with the lifters after the fact so I can get a lot more 3D out of it. It's just, I like the effect I get with that. That's personal uh, preference on that. And that's really what a lot of this comes down to. You ask any leather worker out there, um, you know, what's uh, the right way to do anything. And, and however that person you ask, that's the right way to do it. Yeah, you know, they all have the right way to do it. We used to, I, I used to do all the leather shows, you know, I used to be Tandy's face at all these leather shows, and it was really one of the things we would joke amongst ourselves about is that, you know, um, there there's only two people in the world that's ever built a saddle right. The guy you're asked that question up and whoever taught him, you know, and it doesn't matter uh, who you ask, uh, there's only two people that ever did it right, and that's how we are. And, and I, I'm, the, I'm sure I'm the same way. I, you probably have found out I have some preferences and some opinions. And uh, the way I like to do things, is that the only way to do it? No, it is not. Oh my gosh, there's so much other leather work out there that, that can be done and, and um, needs to be done. You all have a lot of ways to go with that. All right, while you are all catching up, let me, let me see what else I got here for samples to show you. Let's, uh, let's go to, we've been talking about shared, and let me get this piece out here because it's pretty Sheridan-esque. Uh, in fact, it was done by a guy by the name of Don Butler, who probably one of the better saddle makers I've ever met. Uh, good friend. I'm still mad at him for dying. Um, what was his name? Don Butler. Um, he had a, a saddle shop in Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, his daughter ended up opening up one called um, uh, Wyoming Leather Supply or something. No, what was it? Something like that. Anyway, he had a little... That was his shop, but then his daughter opened up, I think it was, uh, I don't know. They, she had a, a leather supply place, too, there that uh, that they had in, in Sheridan. So anyway, uh, family's been in it, and, and but he's kind of the guy. He... he uh, and just an amazing leather worker. And here's your classic Sheridan stuff. And um, and by classic, let me show you what makes it classic or what people recognize as Sheridan. But I'll also show you some things that are, that are borrowed. I mean, look, like these flowers right here are very much like what I just showed you. Am I not on camera? Okay. Okay. Um, these flowers right here are very similar to what you just saw me, saw me showing you with the, the uh, Northwest style. So those guys borrow, use that as well. This leaf right here, uh, actually this acorn right, uh, oak leaf, uh, is very similar to what would be called a, a uh, Arizona style oak leaf. They do oak leaves in Arizona. They would do them like this with the heavy veining and such running up the the leaves like that. But what makes us Sheridan? Well, Don Butler is what makes us Sheridan. That's where he lived and worked and such. But what did they do? Why do, why do you recognize it like that? Is again that flow. A lot of people, this is what people see. When they see a, a Sheridan thing, they see this these circles running everywhere. And, and that literally, that's how they lay it out. They'll, they'll draw a circle and you know, how many circles on here, and then they'll they'll figure out how to feed this one into that one and so forth. Um, with this particular one here, um, and, and most uh, uh, Sheridan style designs, um, you'll find one flower where they started the pattern, where they started the flow of the pattern. And I thought I had that spotted earlier on here, but yeah, yeah um, I think it's this one here. This, this flower right here, I think, is where he began the pattern. This one here totally circumnavigates itself, all right? But from there, then it branches off to this one, and from 
uh, and, and over to here, and then over on the, where else? Okay, up here you branches off. Oh yeah, this one here continues on up here. So they basically start one, but then the, the next one branches out from under that, and that's kind of how they how they, they weave all of these together. Um, the thing that, uh, I guess this is a, a, a habit, or maybe it's just the way they do it, but the majority of, of the Sheridan style designs, they fill all of the blank spaces with like umpteen jillion of these little leaves like this. They, I mean, they'll stick, they call them stickers, they call them stubs, they call them a lot of different things. Yeah, whatever they call them, but I mean, and, and which is one of the things I really dislike about Sheridan is that there's no imagination of that. You, you just put in 17 of these in there and you fill that space. You know, that's that's just, that's not all that creative. They have like not enough variety of, of, of elements to work into their design. They are very reliant upon that. They do have a variety of leaves that they use. Um, this type of a leaf, this one here, these here, they, you'll find a variety of different types of leaves that are used in in uh, in there, uh, and one of the things, uh, each one of these Sheridan um, gurus, whoever they are, um, they all have their own thing, and they they think they do it right. We all do. Um, but what you see here with with Don Butler is that he uses a leaf here to, for the the place that he branches a design out. Here's a leaf, and then the the design branches out from underneath that. There's a leaf there, and it branches out from there. He uses something kind of almost like an acanthus leaf, but he doesn't carve it in the traditional way. But that's just a space filler to make his corners come out here. If you'll notice, he just used that to fill in the corner, and that's a good element to do that with. Um, but uh, again, and certainly it's just done with thumbprints. You can tell with that. The the that's why, like on these these long flowing leaves like this that have a curve that follows the flow of the design, all the shading is like a, a dent at the very end of it. It's all it's just a dent at the very tip of it, um, and that's uh, the so the shading here doesn't necessarily follow. What he does magnificently, and the thing that I would encourage you all to pay attention to, is that he did a brilliant job of fading out these lines. As he made these lines that make up the edge of this leaf here, and the edge of this leaf here, and the edge of this leaf here, as he got down here to where that ends up out in the middle of the stem work here, um, it faded out to nothing. And then this next one, it faded out to nothing. And so that's why your eye flows very gracefully around this thing. But if you look at all of these and you see how they all look like they're all headed to the same place, like they might actually connect, that's, that's just graceful. I mean, that is just, that's what you want with when you have these long lines. Um, and I think sometimes what I see in some leather workers today who are trying to mimic this style is that they... Um, they tend to run these long lines all the way around over to here. You know, they, they have these really, really long lines trying to get your eye to follow it rather than using the integration of these lines coming together to draw your eye to that. They'll have this one long line here and it'll run all the way around over to here instead of having it short and then the next one picks up your eye from there and the next one after that. It's just the way uh, Butler was just uh, did a brilliant job of that, though, and I, this is something that I would have you go to school with on that. Um, one of the other things that is used by some, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll share my opinion on it, but um, a lot of times they'll use a mule's foot here to gather together where a bunch of these different elements come together. And so right in here, they, you have a, a, a group of mule's foot, some larger mule's foot impressions, and some use it even bigger than that uh, to gather this together. Why do they do that? Well, I think on some of the folks that do this, and this is me being critical, okay, so y'all take this as just me with my stupid attitude. Um, but I think sometimes they do that to, to hide the fact that they don't have these long, graceful lines. I do know people that are into the world of uh, production work like this. They want to turn out as many as they can. And this takes extra time and effort to get these really nice flowing lines there. But if you get down there and you have all these coming together like that, just you know, run a bunch of meals foots like that right there and it just kind of covers up the fact that you didn't fade out those lines like you should have. I think that's what they do. That's my opinion. Um, the, uh, but the, 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 really, the bigger reason that I don't like that is my eye stops there. 
Uh, when I'm following the flow of this design, I come around there and it hits a dead end right there where they did that. My eye doesn't continue to follow the flow of that design when I see that. So that's really the, the, the big reason I, I personally don't like it is just it, I think it interrupts the flow of the design. And that's totally personal opinion, okay? But anyway, so this is a great one. I, I don't know that I brought anything else that is, well, no, that's not, uh, that's not shared. That's not shared. Um, the the heart that we did was kind of a Sheridan ish thing. Um, we did a video on this, and it'll be out there as a as something you can download. But this here's got a lot of Sheridan effects to it. And this is one of the other things. Um, Butler didn't do this, but the scroll work that you see here is typical of what they do. Well, yeah, he's got one of them in here. Uh -huh. You can see that when they do the scrolls, like. Uh, the scrolls we're doing on the design you have there, it comes to a very tight knot at the very center of it. The scrolls that are used often in the Sheridan type stuff like this um, is more open. They, they, they don't actually curl all the way around and close in on themselves. Um, the, the way the Vayner tools are used around the outside of that is a little bit different than the way we normally would as well. So that's kind of what makes it Sheridan. Um, this one here has some Sheridan elements in it. It's not totally Sheridan. This way that the flower starts here, or the, the, this design starts, this is a heart pattern. Um, this was started with an element here that I got from, this is a Texas guy by the name of Shirley Brown that, that originated this. This is how he would start his patterns quite often. They'd start from a, a, a bud like this coming out of the middle of a flower or something like that. It's a great way to start one, and then you don't have to loop it back onto itself like that. So, And I, there's probably some other things I've got here where, um, it, uh, where it starts like that. Um, but anyway, that's... Uh, um, that one's got a little bit of sharing to it, and, and like I said, that's that's one of the other identifying things is how they how the the scroll work is uh, scrolls are done. So anyway, a lot of folks do that. I've got pieces of leather work. I've got some. I got Don King's work. Doesn't look Sheridan at all. Um, I've got a belt that he did, and it's just very tight, very compact, and it does not have circles running everywhere. But it's a beautiful belt. Um, I've got uh, uh, Chester Hape. Uh, I've got a piece by, um, uh, uh, um, um, yeah. The guy that wrote the book. Um, I've got Gardner. some, huh? Bill Gardner. Yeah, I've got a piece of Bill Gardner's. I have some Clint Fay work. I've got some of uh, uh, G.K. Fraker, who recently passed away. He is very much a Sheridan guy. Anyway, they they all have their. Everyone does it a little different, and you're going to find that even uh, uh, what uh, um, the kind of work that. Uh, that Rocky Minster does it for Porter style stuff is not exactly what um, Ray Poya did or what Merlin Ringlero or some of these other guys that did that kind of, they all had their own style within that bigger regional uh, thing. So that's, uh, anyway, but that that's kind of what the, the share, this, this guy right here, you most feet would idolize him. Those that are in love with the share and stuff think he's, He's one of the great ones, and he is. He's one of the great ones. He's his uh, his his saddles sold for uh, five digits. You know, twenty thousand dollar kind of numbers. He 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 did stuff that 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 went on up there for prices. So anyway, y'all done parachading yet? Yes. Yeah. That's all right. That's right. We'll, 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 we'll get started on because there's a lot of beveling. There's a lot of beveling. Every line that you cut in here has got to be beveled on one side or the other, and even on both sides with some of them. So don't get ahead of me. I was going to ask you these little stickers <laughs> coming up in the middle of this. Did you bevel both sides? Those get beveled on both sides, yeah. And you can just bevel them on both sides, or you could use some kind of fancy figure carving tool to do that. I'll show you what I used, but um, but yes, you can do it with just a beveler if you don't have that. But anyway, there's beveling, and um, you know, going all the way back to what I said about um, working from the foreground into the background, um, kind of really comes into play here for so folks that are kind of just getting at this. What are you making? What what stands out the most here? Uh, what what is the most prominent part of this design? You know, well, you got this this bud or whatever it is coming out of the center and it's made up of one, two, three, four, five petals and 
these here look like they're laying on top of that, and and then that's on top, and then you got this this bowl here. Uh, it's out in front of all these petals here. So if you're going to work from the foreground into the background, we'd start on this, but not just randomly anywhere. Um, we'd start with whatever part of that we think is standing out. And the reason why am I explaining all that? Why am I explaining all that? Well, it's because a lot of folks struggle with figuring out what side. Of, this this can look like a maze to people. I mean, there's just lines running everywhere, and you want me to babble every one of them? There's a 50-50 chance you're going to get the right side, you know. So, uh, so what's understanding what you're making, understanding what it should look like, is really important. But let me show you another really important couple of things. You've heard me already preaching this, all right? You cut some of these lines and they came to a nice, gradual, faded out um, ending. And I'm going to want you to do the same thing with your beveler. Uh, when you're beveling these lines and they come down to the end, one of my rules, I, I hate rules, but one of my rules, and it's a good rule, is bevel as deeply as you cut. So if you cut one-third the thickness, how do you, you cut beveling here? You're beveling that deep. But wait, I didn't bevel that, cut that deep all the way, did I? I here I got lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter, so my beveling needs to get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter, so it fades out as well at the same speed that the cut faded out. Does that make sense? All that stuff I was just bragging about Don Butler, that's what he did. That's why your eye just finds all of that stuff so smooth and so graceful. That's how it's done. It's an important thing, and it separates the amateurs from the pros, is those little finessings. You can bevel all those lines, but, but not get that fading out part going on, and, and it just doesn't flow. It just doesn't flow when you do that. So, Questions about beveling? What kind of beveler should I use? What, what do you got? <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> the ones you got. I'm using some. I have a set here of Barry Kings that I'm going to use. They're a little steeper angle. This one does not need steep angle. Uh, this one here could be done with just regular old bevelers. In fact, I brought those. I, in fact, let me show you. If that's what you got and you think, oh gosh, I don't have Barry King bevelers. Can I even do this? Yes, you can. When, way back when, a long time ago when I got started in leather work, we didn't have steep angle bevelers, you just had one beveler and that was it, one kind of beveler. And if you wanted to use do something and you had a really tight design where the lines got really close together, if you weren't careful, the back end of the beveler would be mashing the line right behind it. So you know what I learned to do? I learned to lean it forward and change it. Now it's a steep angle beveler. Now it works just like and leaves the same kind of an impression that, that Barry Kings does. So if that's what you got, you're just fine. But with the, the, the steep angle ones, they work pretty good. Um, like I said, this one here could be beveled in a traditional manner without too much worry, but I'm going to use these because they have a consistent texture to them. They are checkered, um, and the reason, again, that I like to use a checkered beveler uh, and textured tools in general is because of the kind of finishing technique that I do. Your beveling should be leaving a nice dark burnish wherever you're doing it. So um, that 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 that's the color uh, being brought out. Uh, so if you get hung up, you don't know. All right, what am I supposed to do here? Where do I bevel here on this line here? Well, look at that picture. One side of every one of those lines is going to be darker on one side or the other, and that's going to be the side that was pressed down. I'll tell you what, I can show you how to bevel. I can show you, in fact, let me show you how to bevel. How do you hold this thing? How do you get it so that you don't come out with like a choppy looking beveling? The, the trick to running a beveler is to, and I'm going to jump out of, off of this thing here. I'm going to use one of these larger lines where I can show you what I'm doing. Uh, in fact, let me go to this, the outline here. This is real good. When I'm using a, a beveler, it's still the same grip I was using with the pear shader. I'm holding it with these three my thumb and these two fingers. I have my ring finger again up against the side of the tool. I have the rest of these here resting on the, the leather, so it's not going to move. A lot of times when people find that their leather's moving with their, their work, you're not doing it right. Let me explain. 
When I'm holding this tool, just like with the pear shader, I'm holding it so it's just barely touching the leather. So it's not in a hole. There's, a, and when I move it to the next, push, I'm not pushing the leather. It's sitting on top of the leather. It's just easy to move it to the next thing. If you are scooting the leather as you move your tool, well, then you're not letting it bounce along like you should. And if I were to, again, slow down here, and I don't know what camera you're looking at, but... I'm looking right at you. All right. Well, look at the tool. That's better. Oh, okay. We're looking uh, right at the tool. All right. Look, if you're looking right at the tool, I want you to see how far I move that each time. It's not moving very far at all. And in fact, if you have to slow down and make each deliberate impression like this, do that. Because what we're after is a nice smooth line. We want to look like one tool did all of that, just you know, one fell swoop. If it's coming out bumpy, what's causing that? You're moving it too fast, or you're tipping your tool. If I'm holding this tool pretty much straight up and down, if you get in the habit, and I've seen people do this, they think this is like a chisel, and you got to tip it over like this and then drive it along like that. Well, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have the edge of the tool leaving a mark in the leather. You don't want that. You want to hold this tool for the most part straight up and down. If you have the other type babblers and you need to lean it towards you, you can get away with that. But don't don't lean it back. You don't want to leave a halo on the back side of it either. So hold it pretty much straight up and down. Um, and then when you move it, only move it at most one third the width of the tool as you do it. And bevel to the bottom of the cut. So everybody's will come out perfect then, right? Got it? All right, lots to bevel. I can show you how to bevel. You know what I can't do? I can't show you how to unbevel. <laughs> and you know what I mean by that is that you better make sure you're on the right side of the line before you do it. Don't don't guess. Look at the pattern. If you have a question, come ask me. Yes, sir? Would you bevel this outside border? Yes, I would. Yes, I would, because it's on top, so you're exactly right. And that's where I should have started. Um, I wanted to show this fading out thing, but, um, but yes, I start, I'm going to start and finish this outside border, and I'll bevel the inside of that, too, uh, so that, it, uh, that I have that standing out above all the rest of it. One of the things you'll find, uh, you'll discover for yourself that you can do better with your beveler either pushing it away or pulling it towards you. One or the other works better for you. You, you got to do both. Way. You got to do both because sometimes you just can't get her done without having to do it that way. But you'll find that it works better one way than the other. And so that's all right. If you need to turn your leather so you can do it as good as you can do it, turn your leather so you can do it how good you can do it. Often I'll see people doing their beveling as such. And they, and they don't stop and turn the other, and so I'll see them doing like this, looking around behind it like that, trying to see if, make sure they're on the line. Keep your leather turned so that the, the line that you're beveling is between you and the tool. That way you can see exactly what it's at. And it, guessing to see if you're close to that line ain't good enough, you got to be exactly on that line. you got to have the face or the toe of that bevler right in that cut. That's what you want to have. The bigger the line, the longer and straighter it is, the bigger beveler you can get away with. I'm using the biggest one I brought with me, but they make them twice the size of this, which really would work great going around this border, but that's about the only place I could use it. Do you ever use a push beveler? Um, yeah. To get along with it? No, I hate them. <laughs> Well, but, but you're supposed to ask why. Why? why. why do I hit him? Because you can't get depth out of your leather work. A push babbler works great for straight lines and borders and things like that. You can't do detail work with it. They don't work for that. Um, they also don't get you depth. And they also come out slick. They don't ever have a texture. You can't use, you can't do that. So I know people that'll use them to clean up their beveling because it comes out too rough. And by the way, if your, lever, if your beveling's coming out choppy and bumpy, fix it. Yeah, fix it. Go back over it again and clean it up. Slow down. You're moving your tool too fast. Don't put any more water on there right away. You're pretty wet. I'm going to take this away from you. <laughs> Y'all get quiet with a hammer in your hand. That's a good thing.
Nobody asked me about why I'm using a rawhide hammer. I see a lot of malls out here. And what else do I see being used? Um, a lot of malls. Everybody's using a mall. I'm the only one that's not doing it right? Yep. What's up with that? Man. Well, I apologize. I'll try to get it right next time. I think we have a sale on uh, a striking stick, yeah. Axe handle with rawhide wrapped around the head of it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've got, I've got some of those too. Um, yeah. Okay. I've got some rub sticks made of lake and vita and they're, they're pretty good. There's a, a little bit of an oil in them that, uh, that you know, the more you use them, the better they get. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Right. This is one of those places a lot of people would use something called the back beveler. So I'm back beveling this right now. You would do that now. Well, you can, or you can do it later if you want. Which you do it now, so yeah. that's obviously. Yeah, because yeah, and then I can clean up this here if I'm leaving some marks over on this when I did the rest of the beveling. So, so, so. Y'all, for just a second, might have you look up here and see what I'm doing. I'm doing stuff you might want to know about. Um, what I'm doing is I'm, they make tools today. We were, I was mocking somebody that uses back bevels all the time, but I won't mention his name, but yeah. Um, anyway, back bevels, what are they? It's, well, it's some tools that they created to go back over lines like this where you have a nice, sharp, crisp edge like this. Done a really good job with the beveling. Um, and then you want to have more of a rounded look. I want this little bead here to look rounded. And so I'm taking my modeling spoon. This is what I've always done. And you know what? I can back bevel the fire out of this just like that. You know, I just run that along there and, and knock that square corner off there. It goes really quick, really fast. And, um, and why am I doing it now? This is what the question that was being asked is that, you know, it leaves a little scratchy over on this side, so I can now, as I bevel this part up to that, it'll clean all that up, you know. So that's why I'm doing it right now. Um, but, yeah, I want a nice rounded thing here and get rid of that square corner. A modeling spoon is just pretty darn awesome. That's what I use all the time to do that. I do have, they, uh, I do have other tools that I can do this with, but this right here is what I have with me. And so, you know what, if you want this to be all rounded off and such, um, this would be a good way to do it. So, anyway. I usually back bevel, but I'm using marker. Well, you, you, I'll bet I can do that faster than you can with it. Are you rounding on both sides? With this, sides? yeah, a lot faster than you can. Are you rounding on both sides? I did. See your beveling control? It's kind of a little rough. Yes. Actually, I did. Yeah, I'm going to rounding on both sides. I don't use a hammer back bevel. Yeah. Yeah, and I I know people that make those now, but yeah, that works too. That's basically the same thing. Yeah. And if you have one, but I didn't use that because most people don't have that, so I have one of those too. But so I'm not using it. But you're exactly right. That if you have that, that's about as quick as it is. And you've fortunately got a left-handed version of it, so it obviously works. Yeah. Yes, it is.
but it works, and that's that's the bottom line. You know, it, I've said it. I don't know how many times already. Don't get hung up on what you're using. Hung, get hung up on the results you're producing. Is that what gives you the results you like? That's the right tool to use. Um, so. Well, thank you. I'm easily How's it going? I'm having fun, but you got to work today, though, huh? We don't. This ain't work. This ain't work. Way back when I was getting started uh, doing leather work a little bit in uh, I would go into the Mile City Saddlery and, you know, as a, as a little guy, you know, they'd let me look over their shoulder and such, those guys that were working, and I was just always amazed at the, the work they were doing and fascinated by it. Uh, but when I got older, I, and I went in there and I was doing some leather work and I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to learn more. I wanted those guys to share what they were doing and such, and if I asked too many questions, Sometimes they, I, they, they do that, you know, they just flip over whatever they're doing. And, um, you know, and they'd visit with me, you know, they wouldn't run me off or anything. But they just, you know, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna show me all of the, the, those things that I was wanting to know. And, you know, there's some great leather workers that went through there. Some of them that far better than I'll ever be. And you don't know their name today, you know why? Because their knowledge and their ability went to the grave with them. They never shared it. And I, you know, I don't, I, I think it's important that we pass this on. I think it's important that, you know, that, that's why so many people don't know about all these different regional styles. I mean, uh, who's gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna, most of the work, let me think. Well, yeah, I got a couple here that are not dead yet, but the majority of the stuff I've been showing you, those people are dead. <laughs> They're not doing any more leather work. Uh, they were some of the better about sharing what they do, but I think it's important that we make sure that we get this passed along um, to others. Um, I think it's very important that we do that, so. All that to say, if there's something you've always been wanting to ask somebody, you got me cornered over here. I pretty much got to answer you. So please, please, please ask those questions. I, that's why I'm here. Um, What? So did you use the, the larger end or the smaller end of the, of the modeling spoon? Um, on this, I probably used the larger one. Okay. But and the curved part goes. What are you trying to accomplish? This way, right? Well, this direction. yeah. The, the, the first question is what do you want it to do? So I, I want you to be able to answer this question next time you do something. This ain't about just how to do this this thing this time, I want you to be able to think through this. So what are you trying to accomplish? What I wanted to do is I wanted to create a nice rounded shape to this. And so I took this tool and I leaned it over like this on the outside edge, I guess with that camera like that. If I'm on the inside edge, I had it like that. So you used the back side. I used the back side of it, right, because I didn't want to take a divot out of there or anything like that. And I just ran it around like that with just a little bit of pressure on that and it just pressed that corner down it rounded that off and that that's what I did but when you're when you're doing things like that those are great questions to ask but I want you to think through it I want you to be able to answer those yourself next time when you're working at home and you're not I'm not across the room for you to ask that question to I want you to be able to figure that kind of stuff out
beveling. They will bevel every line they can with the big beveler, and they bevel every line they can with the smaller. How do you, how would you keep that straight? Um, again, that personal preference as far as method. Um, I know when I was doing leather work for that saddle shop and um, was turning out something for the second or third time that I've done it or more, you know, I would do exactly that. In fact, um, that was all about getting it done, you know. And if you're into the mode of production work where you want to just get this done, that's exactly how they do it. They'll work with the largest tool they have, do all they can with that, and then work on down to the next one and so forth. I once, uh, when I had uh, that, uh, uh, some time to visit with Rocky Minster, he, when he first started out, he used to build belts for a Western wear shop. They, you know, all the belts they had there were hand tool belts, and he had a contract to do those, and, and uh, in fact, he had made himself a belt the night before. And I said, really? And he said, oh yeah, that's nothing to making a belt. And he said, I used to make uh, 24 of these a day. I said, what? And he said, oh yeah, nothing to it. He said, you just have to set up and be ready to do it. He said, what I would do, he said, I'd, obviously I'd get, I'd only work on 12 at a time, you know. So uh, he said, I would, uh, I'd get my strips cut and I'd have them all laid out here and I'd take my tap off and I'd tap off, you know, all of them like that. Then I'd, I'd, I'd cut them all and I'd cut all of them that I could cut this way, like that, on all of them like that. And then I'd turn them all around and I'd cut everything I can cut this way like that, and then I'd do the same, you know, I'd bevel them, I'd, you know, bevel everything I could with it laying this direction, and then I'd, with each one, and then I'd turn the whole bunch around and I'd bevel everything I could the other direction. He said, and you could knock them out like that. He wasn't doing any fancy dyeing or finishing like that, it was probably just oiling them or whatever, but yeah, he, and they were not anywhere as intricate as this. They were nice, long, sweeping patterns that fall the flow, you know, that, that were not really ornate, but um, but that's what he did. He said that's how you do it. Production work and doing the best carving job you can are two different things. Um, and as I mentioned to you about thumbprints, thumbprints were created um, uh, to do that kind of work specifically. They were for doing a particular kind of work. Not to do all shading on all leather work everywhere. But a lot of people think, oh, I got a thumbprint so I can do all shading everywhere on anything. That, they were never made for that. And they won't. They won't do all of that. They were made to do something specific. things like that, learning to work with the bigger to the smaller or learning how to do everything you can one direction and the other. I don't have to teach that. People who have the responsibility of turning stuff out, people, where you find that is people that have piecework to do, you know. You get paid the same amount of money whether you spend all day doing that or you can do it in a half a day, you know. And so that's where people find ways to cut corners to do it faster and quicker. I'm not going to teach that. Uh, that people will figure that out on their own um, because they out of necessity. Let me tell you all another story about Porter Saddlery. Um, I've learned a lot about that. I know some folks that well got a chance to visit with some folks that used to be a part of that. They used to have a, there's a guy, a young man came in there one day, well, the story behind him, his name was Bob Dellis, I don't know if you ever heard that name. Bob Dellis was a leather worker that uh, ended up being a fantastic leather worker. I think he was down in Florida when he passed away, but he was uh, uh, 
young man breaking horses. I think he was up in Wyoming or somewhere and, and uh, was breaking horses and well, he got bunged up. You know, he busted an arm or a leg or something like that and it wasn't uh, found. He was laid up and so while he was laid up, he started building some shafts and doing some leather work and stuff and he said, you know, this is a lot easier on the body than <laughs> breaking horses is. It uh, doesn't wear you out quite so bad. And uh, so he was down in, in Arizona and, and saw an ad that Porter's was looking for some leather stampers and, and uh, they uh, he went in there and he was kind of a cocky fellow. He was, I'll bet he was, I don't know, shortest person in here. I promise you he was shorter than whoever's the shortest person in here. He's just a little guy. Uh, and he, uh, when he would show up at the shows, he had a vest that was to totally tooled from top to bottom. And he, his boots, he had his pant legs tucked in his boots, you know, because they were all tooled. And he showed off his stuff. Anyway, great guy. Um, but it, he went in there and uh, he said, yeah, I'm the guy you're looking for. I can tool your leather for you. Um, so uh, they said, well, okay, we, we could use a stamper. He said, uh, here's a, uh, and they gave him some, uh, 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 some pieces, I think it was some bridles, um, so here, stamp these up and we'll uh, see how you do, but you know, let's see your work you know, first, and anyway, he come back a day or so later with the first one done, and they looked at it and they said, do uh, you, you still have that other leather we gave you, could we get that back, you know, because they, they weren't very impressed, uh, but rather than run him off, they they uh, they put him made him work actually right on the bench next to Ray Poya and so Ray you know in fact back then what they would do is they they'd have I think they had him doing the backgrounding and that was just it you know he Ray do everything and then they get to the backgrounding have him do the backgrounding and then when he got to where he could do that pretty good they would maybe let him do the beveling and 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 backgrounding and eventually they you know broke him into where he could do all of the above but in the meantime they had him cleaning the place and they had him. Uh, I'm, uh, um, receiving the leather that came in and back in those days the leather came in on rail cars it came in stacked on rail cars and who knows what else was in that rail car along with that I mean it could have been not, it, who knows what came in there it, but he had to clean it up he had to, and there would be footprints there'd be you know maybe tire tracks who, who knows but he'd have to clean it up and get it ready for these guys but bottom line the reason I'm telling you that story is you know what today Porter saddles are one of those things that people would die to have in their collection. The, the leather that came from these, these places like that. And you know what? They had to make do with what they had. They didn't have, probably have Herman Oak leather to use. They probably had to use whatever they could get their hands on. And they had to use what was there because getting leather was probably six months out or however. You know, you ordered a, a, a car, a rail car of it. You couldn't, you couldn't go on... Uh, the internet and get some from Amazon or wherever and have it delivered tomorrow. And if it came in and it was kind of not so pretty, you didn't get to complain and say, oh, that leather's really bad, I can't use it. And so let me send it back, you know, and get me a prettier piece. They couldn't do that. But those are the, that's what they did. They had to learn how to be craftsmen. They had to learn how to make do with what they do. Ray Poya, I have a set of Ray Poya's tools. They're all handmade. He made all of his own tools. And he, in fact, the story about, I don't know if you've ever heard about Hackbarth Hack tools. Ray Hackbarth was the guy that uh, built tools down in Arizona. Um, and he, his prototypes were made by taking something and say, you know, here, I think this will work. And he'd take it in and give it to Ray Poy and say, here, try this, see how it works. And he'd come back a couple weeks later and pick that up, and Ray Poya would have totally refinished it and made it work the way he thought it ought to work because he used them every day. Ray Hackbarth was not a leather worker. He was a tool maker. Ray Poya was a leather worker and a tool maker. And so anyway, a lot of the prototypes then that are all of the Hackbarth tools that came out were redesigned by people that actually used them. And that's, what, that's true about all the tools for the most part that we use today. But anyway, all those guys were craftsmen. He, he, the reason Ray Poya knew how to do that is when he had a design, he wanted to do something, he made a tool to do it. We don't do that today. We don't have to do that today. If, if there's something you don't, you, you just went out there and got you a bunch of pear shaders. I mean, how hard was that? You know, you don't have something you need, you just go get it, right? Learning how to make do is part of being a craftsman. I grew up on a ranch. I know how to use baling wire and duct tape. I do. I know how to use it really well. And you know, and it's, it's a good skill to have. 
And the same thing applies with leather. When you don't have something that's exactly the thing that somebody else over there is using, well, what do you got that you can do something similar with? The thing I would love for every one of you to go home with is that idea that, you know, I can do whatever I want with what I have. And you can. You may not believe it yet, but you can do whatever you want with what you have. You know what you need, though? You have the thing most people are missing or, or don't have enough of is imagination. Imagination and creativity is even more important than the tools you have, believe it or not. And most people don't have enough of it or don't use what they have often enough. All right, while I have your rapt attention, I'm pretending that I do. Um, I want to show you one other thing I'm going to do to this flower, okay? I'm going to do something else to this flower. I got it beveled. I, I beveled the flower. You can see I double beveled this little crease in the middle of that. But around here, it looks like this all tucks under way too sharp. There, I, I did a good job of beveling. It's nice and deep. It's easily the one-third of the thickness. But I, don't, I want them to look like these meet together here a little bit. So I'm going to take back over in the world of, of Sheridan-style stuff, they have what's called uh, center shaders. It's kind of like a thumbprint except one end of it squared off or rounded off a little bit so that you can use it kind of like a, a beveler as well. And I'm going to take and flatten this out so I get rid of that halo. So what do I mean about halos? Halos are when you have, like here, I beveled really deep and you can see where the back edge of that beveler quit beveling. That's a halo. And I just got rid of that halo by taking and flattening that out. And you know what? This tool has vertical lines on it and it blends right in with my pear shape. I almost did that on purpose. Um, so anyway, so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm flattening out. You know what? Most of the people will never ever know I did that unless I stopped you all and made you see what I'm doing. And why did I do that? Because I want this to stand out even more. I don't want it to look like this just chiseled in there. I want this to look real, three-dimensional. And that's the little stuff that you do. Nobody's going to see it except you. I did that because of me. I wanted it. I did it because I wanted it to be like that. So. Anyway, go ahead, hammer some more. <laughs> what if you don't have one of these? What are you going to use? Um, okay, let's use a pear shader. You know, that's how I, I never had one of those until somebody said, hey, did you know they make center shaders? I always used to just take like the same shader I use, that long skinny one, and I'll just tip it up and use it like a beveler. You know what that's called? It's called make and do with what you got. If you don't have that, figure out how to do what I just did with what you got. I think one of the things that I can hear because I don't have a hammer in front of me, <laughs> but the amount the less that you are tapping this compared to your bevel. Yeah. Well, you got to be conscious of the effect you're trying to create. There's places where I want some depth, and I'm really whacking that. Obviously, a bevel has got a start sharp toe on it, and if I hit it with the force, I hit this blunt tool, the pear shader, it's going to go through this yeah. piece of leather, even with that cardboard on the back. I can whack the heck out of it. But, yeah, you're right. You have, to, you have to adjust the force of the tool. When we get into using veiners and things that have a really sharp cutting edge on them like that, we've got to adjust the force to what, you know, what we're doing and the effect that we're trying to create on the leather. So, but, yeah, good, good analysis. Of course, part of the reason I can talk and do this is my, my mallet actually, head actually flies off of here and doesn't interrupt what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> We've got <picture> <laughs> That's why I use this instead of a mall. <laughs> we'll probably insert a picture right there so everybody can see it at home. <laughs> <laughs> Never know the things that will happen. Make use of it. <laughs>
By the way, if you would like to meet some of these people that I've talked about, or at least listen to them, Ray Poya and Don King and um, uh, Bob Dellis, they, there was a, a get-together up in Sheridan and a Cali. It's been maybe 20 years ago or more, but it's called Gathering of the Masters, and these guys were still available at the time, or still alive at the time, and they were there. Bill Gomer was part of it, and he, he's uh, just recently passed away. But anyway, they did a, a, a little video script where they told their story about how they got started and things like that, and uh, um, Anyway, it was recorded, and uh, I kind of got a hold of a copy of the master of that, and it's now out on, I think it's out on Facebook, or on my uh, YouTube page, uh, all of these people. So if you want to hear Ray Poya and actually watch him do some leather work, or want to hear uh, Bob Dellis or Don King, all these guys do some leather work and, and share their knowledge a little bit, it's there, it's available, so go check that out. Um, it's important that we preserve those things. I mean, those are the folks that we're sitting here trying to mimic what they did. We're trying to learn what they did. Um, so. so you mean he's doing, he's doing work on video and he didn't flip it over? Uh, yeah, he didn't flip it over, yeah. yeah. Some of these guys, I, I was kind of sort of involved with that. And uh, yeah. getting them to be comfortable in front of the camera was a fun thing to do. Um, yeah. As you know, sometimes people are edgy when they get in front of a camera. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Brings out a different personality. Yeah, yeah, well. The shy ones. The shy ones, yeah. <laughs> I haven't had that problem. No, you're not at all. You know what I do? I, I do a class up in, I, I should have done it here, just, just for fun, but I do a class up in Sheridan every year. I've done it now for, well, what, 22, 23 years. Uh, it's a free class that I do for kids where we take them through the basics of leatherworking, and they it, we have four hour class, and uh, and I'll have you know I'll have forty kids in there you know and boy you turn kids loose with with mallets and let them make noise like that you know without getting in trouble it man, they are having the time of their life but you and there's points at which and one of the things I've learned and kind of adults are like this too but. Um, Sometimes you have to give it to them in bite-sized pieces. You can't like just, here's everything you need to know, so watch me all the way through and then now you go do it. No, you don't do it like that. You have to give it to them in bite-sized pieces. So we do that with the kids. We let them play with the tools a little bit. But you've got to get their attention at some point. So we'll usually pick up some, some kind of, of a funny word, you know, like cucumber. Or something like that, and and but before we do that, everybody's well. I, before they start hammering, I say, I'm, "Okay, here's a test. This, in fact, it's very important. Most adults can't do what I'm going to ask you to do, so I want you to to, to listen real carefully. Uh, at some point, I'm going to holler out as loud as I can, cucumber. And the and your, the goal is to see how fast you can put your mallet down and get totally quiet. Okay, and you know what? It works. It works with that. And, and I actually did that with those folks in Spain. I don't remember what the word was. You know, it might have been, <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> but I it did the same thing, and it works. It works, you know, but you got to make a game out of it anyway. Now I'm teaching you how to teach, which that's okay. You all can do this, you know. It's all right if you want to go share what you're learning here with somebody else. I'm okay with that. There's not enough people that go do what I do. I need help. And I, rumor has it I'm getting older. Yeah. Now that was not a place to laugh right there. <laughs> Whoever did that. <laughs> I was laughing at myself. Okay, okay, all right. Um, but, I, you know, there'll be a point at which somebody's got to step in here and do what I'm doing. Somebody's got to get this presented to the next generation. All this fun stuff, look at all this stuff I brought with me to show you the guys that told us how to do what we're doing. Who's going to pass what you know on to the next generation if it isn't you? They don't learn in person anymore. That's why we're videoing it. <laughs> yeah, but it's more fun. It is, yeah, it is more yeah. fun, but they, they don't believe you. Uh, 
That's because you don't talk loud enough. No, it, it, it is fun. I, you know, hopefully, well, the whole reason, you, going all back, you want to hear more about me? Sure. Yeah, right, I'm sure. But you're going to hear it, hear it anyway. Um, way back when, I told you I, I was working construction. I was in the construction business, and I, but I was doing all this leather work on the side because that's really what was the fun stuff. That's what I really liked doing. I enjoyed doing it. Made a little bit of money at it, but I, that wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't have a passion for construction work. Let me just say that. In Montana, not only does it get cold in the winter, it gets hot in the summer. Um, and so um, I was working a job in Billings, Montana one time, and it was uh, kind of in the, I guess it was early spring, headed towards summer. And uh, I wanted to, uh, I, I picked up the newspaper and I saw in the newspaper that Tandy Leather was looking for people that would work, go to work there with the potential for a career opportunity. And I said, oh my God, how cool would that be? I could, I could actually do the stuff that I love to do and, and maybe I could make a living at it. That would be the perfect job for somebody like me. But the problem was that I... Tandy closed like at 5.30 or 5 o'clock, I don't remember what it was at the time, and the job I was working on was out of town and we were doing, we were driving creosote piling, which was kind of nasty, smelly stuff and pretty greasy, and, uh, but for me to get to Tandy, I had to go like straight from the job down to, to the Tandy leather store to be, be able to get there in time before they closed, so anyway, I go hauling down there from the job, and I'm dressed in coveralls. And I got a hard hat on, and my hair back then was well down here on my shoulders, and my, my beard was probably middle of my chest at the time. And my coveralls are covered with creosote, uh, which is nasty, smelly stuff. And so I go walk, waltzing in there just before closing time and say, hey, I hear you're looking for some help. And you know, I got some really strange looks. Um, they were not thinking this was what they were going to hire. And um, anyway, I, the guy looked at me kind of sideways, but he said, well, here, fill this out, give me an application and bring it back. And uh, so I did. I, and I went back in there. You know, on Saturday, I'd cleaned up a little bit. I still hadn't got a haircut or anything. But I went back in there on Saturday, and I took some leather work with me and showed them that, yeah, I really do do leather work. And, and when they saw it, they said, hey, that's pretty good. And then they found out that, you know, this place that I was doing the leather work for in uh, that saddle shop, they were a Tandy leather distributor. So they had talked me into teaching some classes. Uh, somebody at Tandy had said, you know, if you want more business, you got to teach people how to use this stuff. And so they conned me into doing some classes. So when they found out that I taught people how to do leather work, I was pretty good at it, and I was looking to get into the business, they said, what, when can you start? The job's yours. And so my next question was, what does it pay? <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned at the time, I was working highway construction. It was pretty good paying stuff. I was probably back in, this was 1978, I was probably making about, about $15 an hour. And so when I asked the question, what does it pay? The guy said, well, it's minimum wage, but you get a lot of hours. And so I had to ask, well, what's minimum wage? Because I didn't have a clue. And at the time, it was two sixty-five an hour. And I go, whew, that's going to be fun. But you get a lot of hours. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, that took a lot, of, a lot of talk. And my sweet wife and was in that conversation that, can we do this? Should we do this? You know, and anyway... We decided to because, well, we were young and stupid at that time. I was young and stupid at that time. She wasn't stupid, but I was. And, uh, you know, you don't do things like that when you're old and wise. You do things like that when you're young and stupid. So I made that the brilliant decision to quit a $15 an hour job on a Friday and go to work for minimum wage on a Monday. And, uh, well, and here I am. <laughs> Here's what I get to do. It, it did work out. But why do you do stuff like that? Why would somebody do something like that? Well, in my case, 
I, I blame it on being young and stupid, but it did turn into a heck of a career. And it turned into an opportunity to use something that I did have a passion for and make my life, um, make that what my life is about. And which is, I guess, why y'all wanted to come see what I have to do with leather. I don't know why you're here. Um, but, um, you know, having a passion for what you do is kind of important. I don't care whether it's leather work or whatever, video work or, I, it doesn't matter. But do what you do. If you, they say that if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, you know? And I, I definitely am that guy. I, I definitely got to do that. I got to spend my life doing what I love to do. And I retired from Tandy after almost 40 years with them. I retired uh, over five years ago now. And look what I'm doing still. I mean, look what I'm still doing. I wasn't there ever because I got to have some title or prestige or whatever. I don't know if I ever had any of that. Um, I was there because I loved what I did. I, and I love to be around the people that do what I love to do. And so, um, and yep, I still do it. Uh, October uh, this year, I'm, well, actually, uh, next, uh, where are we at? O we're still in July. We're still in July, okay. Yeah. So in August, in a couple weeks, I'll be teaching classes in Waco, Texas. Um, and then uh, September, Denise and I are going to take a cruise. We're going to go to Alaska. But you know what? <laughs> While we're in Anchorage, Alaska, I'm actually going to teach a workshop. <laughs> The Tandy store found out we're going to be in town, and they said, hey, while you're here, could you, would you? And so I'm going to teach a half-day workshop up there uh, one day while I'm there. And so we'll do that while we're cruising. Um, then we'll come back from that, be home for a... Golly, what else? We've got the International Federation of Leather Guild show going on, um, which i got to do. I guess I'm involved with that. Um, and then, uh, then we're going to Norway again to teach a class over there. Uh, they've act, invited me back again. Actually, I was supposed to go there before COVID set in. We had tickets bought and everything like that, and then then airlines and everything, the world decided to shut down. And so that one got put on, on ice. But I've been over there about four times now, five times, I don't know, uh, teaching classes over there, and that, that's always a lot of fun. And so... I haven't really suffered because I made that decision to go from a high paying job to a minimum wage job. That, that hasn't really come back to haunt me too much. And believe me, believe me, my, my folks, her folks, everybody thought that was the stupidest thing. Why would you do something like that? I mean, that is just insane. Why would you do that? Give up a good paying job like that to go do, do leather work? What? Passion will take you further than else. Well, you know what? For most of my life, then working in the leather industry, I had people come in and say, man, you got the best job in the world. You get to do this every day. You get to work around the leather industry and you and 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 you make a living doing it and you know I, I do this as a hobby but man I wish I could do more of it I wish I had more time I wish I wish this is what I could do I I hear, heard that all the time and you know what uh, there's a lot of people that do leather work when they get the chance to there's a lot of people who use leather work to get away from their job to, to to relax and have a minute to themselves you know they they can Hallelujah. go huh <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir, aren't I? Yeah. Uh, um, but I, that's uh, I had I had uh, the best job in the world, and which is actually why. In fact, I'd have, like I said, at these shows and stuff, I I was the face of Tandy for a lot of, a lot of years, and I'd have people come up and and tell me that, man, you you really, how how lucky are you? You you got the best job ever, you know, and. And they were right, and so, as I was saying in one of the videos earlier that, you know, I, I feel because of that, because I got to spend my life doing what I, I love to do, um, I feel obligated now 
to do what I'm doing right now. I mean, I had the chance to hang with all these people that we're talking about, you know, and I got a chance to learn from them, and, and I got a chance to work with so many great, talented people over the years, and then sp spend a lot of my time perfecting my skills. How wrong would that be if I were to just like go to my shop and just like hibernate there, you know, and, and just hoard all of this. Be like that guy in the saddle shop that, you know, like hid, hid away and didn't share uh, the stuff that I'd learned. How wrong would that be? You all could just say shame on you. I mean, you got to do every the stuff that so many people would love to do. And then you're going to act like this in retirement. Shame on you. So as long as the good Lord allows, gives me the strength and the ability and vision and opportunity, I'm going to do this. I don't think I have a choice. And it's not like it's painful. <laughs> I, I'm not up here suffering, I want you to know. <laughs> I'm up here doing what I love to do. So there you go. A little snapshot of me. About what? Eating the bike. Where? When? How? Right here. We, we brought it. Well, not here because we have leather everywhere. But up by Denny's area, I think they brought, we had the food catered in and have it up there for it. Okay, wherever, whenever. If it's okay. there and it's, it's ready and it's, it's hot. It's right here. They're getting it ready. Okay, well, when it's ready, holler. We'll, ah! I'll, where, where it's, I'm at a stopping point wherever that last tap of the mallet was so all right well lay it down okay lay it down so this is where you yell cucumber or whatever cucumber. <laughs> see kids do this better than adults i told you that yeah see they're still going they don't believe me at all <laughs> all right